Max Highlights. And here's your host, Megan Lee. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Highlight Show, bringing you the best picks of the week. Here's a look at what's coming up. Formula for Success, how traditional fashion label Louis Vuitton stays on top. Christmas in Stockholm. We take a tour of the Swedish capital during the holiday season. And twist of fate. Refugees produce designer furniture for a Berlin startup. Well, it's one of the biggest names in fashion with signature handbags recognizable anywhere. Louis Vuitton in business for over 160 years. Well, the luxury French label has long been associated with the creme de la creme of the celebrity world, including Catherine Deneuve, Bono, Sean Connery, Madonna, Angelina Jolie, just to name a few. Now, the brand's history and staying power are the focus of a major exhibition in Paris, where it all began. This trunk was the beginning of a unique success story. When 33-year-old Louis Vuitton founded his company in 1854, this product made it famous overnight. That was more than 160 years ago. Now an exhibition at the Grand Palais in Paris takes visitors on a tour through the company's history. Louis Vuitton realized that travel had become less individual and people were moving around in large groups on big ocean liners, trains and so forth. So he developed a trunk whose top was no longer round but perfectly flat to allow stacking. He developed a water-resistant fabric to waterproof the trunk. And inside he put lots of compartments and clothes hooks so that things could be easily found and didn't get jumbled together. Louis Vuitton trunks, bags and wallets are now status symbols around the world. Forbes magazine says Louis Vuitton is the world's most valuable luxury brand. The founder's great-great-grandson, Patrick Louis Vuitton, feels that running the firm today is a great honor, but also a great obligation. If I design a trunk, it has to be at least as beautiful as the trunks that my grandfather or great-grandfather made. I can't fall beneath that standard. I always have to know what I'm doing. So I'm very proud to be part of this company, but it's also a responsibility. What is the secret of this brand's success? Ingeborg Harms, a fashion journalist with the German edition of Vogue, says the main factor is the combination of tradition and innovation. Louis Vuitton simply understands how to keep continuously developing its products. Bags and cases remain at the center. The materials can be new, with patent leather, with new forms, but there is always an echo that keeps the history alive. This exhibition also makes people aware of the company's history. That's part of the strategy and a very smart move. Some of Louis Vuitton's top products are on display here in the Grand Palais. New means of travel created the need for new bags. The steamer bag, invented to stow soiled laundry on cruises, has prevailed as a normal travel bag. For the pioneers of flight, there was the aero trunk, with the ladies' version, the aviette. And for people traveling by train, handy bags that stowed easily under the seat or on the luggage rack. Over the decades, celebrities have adorned themselves with Louis Vuitton products, from boxer Muhammad Ali to film icon Audrey Hepburn to pop singer Rihanna. Familiar faces are very important for a brand's strategy because we live in a big, fast, loud world in which many, many trademarks compete for attention. And if, for example, you're able to persuade Mikhail Gorbachev to star in your ad campaign shortly after 1989, of course that really stands out. Another important part of the brand's strategy is its custom-made products. Today they are produced in a studio near Paris. An early custom-made product was waterproof trunks for André Citroën. In the 1930s, the car maker drove 13,000 kilometers through Asia. The trunks kept his clothes and cooking equipment well organized. Another was the special collection for Wes Anderson's film, The Darjeeling Limited. 
It's hard to counterfeit a custom-made product, but forgeries of Louis Vuitton standard products are a big problem for the company. Le faux, c'est la guerre. C'est la guerre totale. We're in a total war against fakes, against traffickers and manufacturers. No one knows how many of them there are. This is the world of child labor and money laundering. And we fight against it every day. It's estimated that just 1% of the bags labeled Louis Vuitton are genuine. That's why the company keeps evolving the recognizable patterns, like the monogram and the damier checkerboard pattern. Combining tradition and innovation remains Louis Vuitton's strategy for continuing success. In the run-up to Christmas, we've been visiting some of Europe's top destinations to see how they're gearing up for the big day. Well, today we are off to Stockholm, where the days are incredibly short at this time of year, but that's not putting a damper on the Swedes' holiday spirit. Sweden's capital, Stockholm, becomes a city of lights in the weeks before Christmas. There are lights everywhere at City Hall, the opera, and in window displays at the Royal Palace. Gamla Stan, the capital's old town, is also brightly decorated. The oldest Christmas market in the city is located on Stortoyet, a small square in the old town. Christmas ornaments have been sold at the red stalls here for more than 100 years. The buildings around it, it's really cool, so it's very, it's very um, Christmassy here. There's no snow, but it's very beautiful. I thought it's very cold, which it is, so that's why we're near the uh, Glöck. Glöck is Sweden's take on mulled wine. It includes cinnamon, raisins and almonds. The non-alcoholic version is also very popular at Christmas markets. Polka Gris are typical Swedish peppermint candy canes. A baker from the village of Grenna called Amelia Eriksson invented them in 1859. Today they are still made according to her recipe and by hand, just like back then. The red and white candy tastes exactly the same, but the color combo makes for a festive treat. Just one island away from the old city is the Swedish Center for Architecture and Design. It's the site of an annual gingerbread house competition. This year is the 25th edition, and the theme is innovative ideas for living. Quite a few masterpieces of gingerbread architecture are on display. For the more spectacular ones, this year there is, uh, for example, one which is like an aquarium where they have made the glass from some form of glucose. And they told me they experimented for days to get this correct, transparent and everything. The Yule goat, or Yulbok in Swedish, is a very important Christmas ornament here. Christina Zundberg's family has been making them for generations. She uses rye to make her goats because the grass can grow quite high and it's very robust. Right now in Advent, she's really busy. The Yule Bok has a tradition from, from the Christmas play where, where people go around villages and, and ask for money and one is dressed in a goat mask. And we also have the god Thor. His, his wagon is driven by goats. St. Lucia's Day is celebrated in churches all over Sweden on December 13th. Every year, the choir of the Sofia Church in Stockholm puts on a concert to mark the holiday. Lucia was a young girl said to have been martyred for her faith at the start of the 4th century. She was Italian, but she's especially revered in Sweden. I think it has to do with the darkness in Sweden at this time of year. Uh, the light is a very important symbol. It's a symbol for life, it's a symbol for hope and uh, good deeds. 
And that was exactly what uh, Lucia, the original saint, did uh, in her time. Ferry rides around the Stockholm archipelago are also very popular in the Christmas season. On the island of Fjedeholmana, visitors can enjoy a traditional feast prepared by Henrik Karlsson, chef at the Fjedeholmana's Krok restaurant. The Christmas smorgasbord is known as the Julbord. Salmon and herring dishes, as well as ham, are a must. Every Swedish family uh, create their own Christmas table for Christmas Eve when they uh, celebrate with their families. And uh, they usually have maybe 15 or 20 different kinds of dishes. Uh, we have uh, 150. Julebord feasts are laid out three times a day at the Fjeda Holmanas Krok. It's a festive and delicious way to get into the Christmas spirit. This year alone, Germany has received approximately one million refugees. Now, many of those people will have to endure a long waiting period before their official status is determined. Without a proper work visa, there isn't much for them to do. But five refugees from West Africa met a different fate. They were hired under a special program to put their artisan skills to use, not only giving them a renewed sense of purpose, but also creating a buzz on the design scene. Each piece of furniture produced by Kukula has a story to tell. The Berlin startup employs five people who fled here from West Africa. For them, creating furniture is a way of shaping their own future. This one's good, this one needs to be a bit lower. The refugees don't have work permits for Germany. But thanks to an educational grant, they're still able to earn a living. I've had a really tough life. Working here has changed so much for me. I've learned to make chairs for the first time, and I've also learned how to build a table. I like to work, and I like learning things. The idea was born during a social project two years ago. Product designer Sebastian Deschle was working with refugees to build furniture for a shelter. The idea was to build something together and to get to know each other. And after three weeks, we'd become like family. They couldn't take the furniture with them because as a refugee, you don't know where you're going next. We had lots of great pieces and nowhere to bring them. And it was just before Christmas, so we thought we'd sell a few. Furniture from the refugee workshop generated a buzz straight away. On the Start Next crowdfunding portal, Kukula raised more than 120,000 euros. That made it one of the most successful startups of its kind this year. The Kukula products have been shown at international furniture exhibitions in Cologne and Milan and sold in pop-up stores such as this one in Munich. The unique handmade pieces cost between 120 and 500 euros. They're beautiful items in my opinion. They're special and interesting. So I'm not surprised that so many people buy them. Kukula's designs are the brainchild of Italian designer Enzo Mari. During the 70s, he designed DIY furniture which people could recreate affordably at home. The Kukula team visited the designer in Milan and he offered them the production rights. He wanted to create a model for a new society. He wanted to take a stand against formalism in design and against capitalism. He wanted to make the customer self-sufficient, so customers could build their own furniture without anyone knowing whether they're rich or poor. He wanted to help create a relationship and learn something from the product. And we are rediscovering these ideas on a new level. Building furniture also gives refugees a chance to come to terms with their own past. These special edition chairs incorporate wreckage from refugee boats that sank in the Mediterranean. I left Libya on a boat like this.
This is my story. At first, we were quite shocked by the idea. But at some point during the discussion, we realized it's okay. We let the customer decide for themselves if they want the products, if they want something like that near them. And if they don't, why not? What we're hoping to create is a discussion. When their one-year educational grant at Kukula comes to an end, the participants hope to gain an official work permit in Germany. The success of their products could help the process, and if all goes to plan, they'll soon go on sale online and in a showroom in Berlin. Time now to take a trip, this time to the land of limericks, leprechauns, and Guinness beer. That's right, we're headed to Ireland, and more specifically to the country's rugged west coast, where dramatic cliffs rise up from a ferocious ocean to make up the wild Atlantic Way. Now that is a route that stretches about 2,500 kilometers up and down the coast. It was open to tourists in 2014. We covered part of that route, taking in some of the most beautiful landscapes along the way. So, without further ado, bon voyage. Rugged landscapes, wild waters, and cheerful people. Ireland's west coast is one of the country's most picturesque regions. And it's not overrun with tourists. The Wild Atlantic Way aims to draw more vacationers here. You have loads of offers for tourists, for walkers, for cyclists, for drivers. You have everything you could possibly wish for. But unlike other places in the world and in Ireland, you have it remotely. Everything here is hidden. You have so many hidden gems in Donegal that you will not find anywhere else. The beauties of the Irish coast can be discovered on the new coastal road. And there's one fabulous beach after another along the way. The beach at Bundoran is especially attractive for surfers. Meter-high waves offer surfing fun like the breakers in Hawaii. And it's the perfect backdrop for filmmakers. German cameraman Andy Janssen is here shooting scenes for a surfing documentary. For him, Ireland is the surfing paradise. I've been in Hawaii in recent years too, but to be honest, Ireland is simply more beautiful. It has structure and energy, it's dynamic and rugged, and has wonderful people with big hearts who are happy to share. The town of Donegal was founded by the Vikings on the shores of the Esk River. Today it's full of small shops, spars and restaurants. In the center of town is Donegal Castle, a monument of Irish and English history built in the 15th century. Gaelic rulers lived here until they went into exile after losing the Nine Years' War against the English. The next stop to the north on the wild Atlantic Way is Killybegs. It's been one of Ireland's biggest fishing harbors for centuries. Boats, large and small, set off from here. The Donegal Bay has got many fish species. Um, in general angling, we go out and we catch mackerel for bait fish. And after that, then we go and fish for pollock. There's some very fine pollock, also cod. A 30-minute drive west from Killybegs brings us to the cliffs of Sleeve League. They tower some 600 meters over the Atlantic and are among Europe's highest cliffs. The view from the top is breathtaking. This is a wonderful place. It's so beautiful. The sky, the, the day that we're having today is just gorgeous. The water, the cliffs, pretty impressive. Magical, wonderful. I like the air, the light, especially because it's so soft here. Visitors get a crash course in the relaxed Irish art of living at Leo's Tavern in Crowley. Live music is played here all year round. 
Leo's Tavern hosted the first performances by the now world-famous pop singer Enya and her family band Clanad. The Irish people, I would say, um, are very relaxed and welcoming and talk with people and, and, and learn where they're from and have, you know, and, and hear their stories and they'll tell them stories, have a drink or two and, uh, and play some music. Visitors would do well to relax and open themselves up to that lust for life while exploring the Irish countryside. To quote the late American singer Marvin Gaye, there ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough to keep extreme athlete Stefan Zegris from getting to his goal, that is reaching the world's highest peaks. Zegris lives in Switzerland, so he's no stranger to the mountains, but his aim now is to explore uncharted, ter uncharted territory in the Himalayas where no man has yet dared to go. An expedition into the unknown. Stefan Siegrist has his sights set on climbing a mountain in Kashmir that bears a strong resemblance to the Matterhorn in his native Switzerland. A striking pyramid the locals call Bala. You know that every rock you touch has never been touched by another human being. No one has ever stood here before. Naturally, that is an exceptional technical and logistical challenge. It's extremely exciting. You're continuously facing unpredictable situations. Every step on the ascent harbors a surprise. The region is unchartered territory. Distances are hard to gauge. When the climbers reach the summit, their altimeter reads 5,900 meters. You're advancing into a region and feel like you're going back in time to the golden age of European alpinism. That era ended in 1865 with the ascent of the Matterhorn, the last remaining unclimbed summit in the Alps. But here, there are certainly more than two unclimbed Matterhorns. Kaban in northern India's Kashmir region. Villagers help Stefan and his team set up a base camp at 4,000 meters. It's the starting point for their ascent. At the summit of the Bala, they spot another unscaled mountain that awakens their ambitions. They decide to tackle another first ascent. Suddenly, bad weather threatens to strike. A sleepless night in the camp. You can't stop thinking about the best way to do it, the safest way to get up there. And then you start thinking, why am I even still doing this? Why are you taking such an extreme risk? But it's just my passion. You have to weigh up what the right thing to do is, if there's even such a thing. The climbers are lucky. The weather doesn't change and they reach the summit without a hitch. Buoyed by their success, they decide to tackle a third, smaller peak. The climb turns out to be one of the most enjoyable in Stefan's career. An amazing day. An amazing view. We found an awesome peak here. Now it's time to head down into the valley. First, the climbers help the villagers with their harvest. Then they learn more about the way of life in this remote part of Kashmir that hasn't hosted foreigners in 80 years. They were astonished that I have nothing better to do in life than climb mountains. Their culture showed me that people who live very simply can be very happy with what they have, seeing how well they get along with one another. It was a valuable experience for me, and a glimpse of this other kind of world would benefit many others. Stefan Siegrist is certain he'll be returning to Kashmir soon, because there are more unscaled summits waiting to be discovered. And that brings us to the end of our highlight show. Well, we hope you enjoyed the best picks of the week. 
from me and the rest of the crew here in Berlin. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon.